want to call the June 20th, 2019 meeting of the Farragut Municipal Planning Commission to order. Uh, we're going to start out with Citizens Forum, and I'd like to remind everybody that on the back of the paper you might have picked up out at the door, uh, we have the protocol for public comments at the meeting. If you wish to say something tonight, for one thing, we need you to fill out a blue card and hand it to Mark Shipley over here. And um, also, we ask that you um, limit your comments to five minutes per person if you uh, have something you wish to say. Uh, also, the Citizens Forum now is for things that are not on the agenda. If there's something you wish to say or a question you wish to ask that has to do with an item on the agenda, please wait until that time. Um, I have a couple of things I'd like to say. Planning Commissioners, uh, today I signed up for the MTES um, training that's in July. Um, you, Mark sent us some information about it. Um, when I called this afternoon, they still had spots available. So if you're interested in it, um, I just called. Uh, I couldn't get the website to work to make, to do it online. So I just picked up the phone and called them and I'm signed up. So if anybody else uh, is interested in doing that, the training will be held at the MTAS office, which is on the UT campus. Um, and there's four hours, I think, in that mark for training that we, we yeah. would get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. four hours. Okay. Um, Mayor, I think you have a couple of comments to make. Uh, yes. Uh, tonight is last night for a couple of people. Um, I think Nick is uh, will be uh, moving off and uh, into other things uh, in your life. Uh, good luck with that. We appreciate your service. Thank you for having me. This was an amazing experience. I'm glad that y'all gave me the opportunity to be a part of this. Well, let's let's hope we see you back here uh, later on in life, okay? Absolutely. <laughs> and the other one is, uh, after many years on the uh, Planning Commission, Ed Whiting will be retiring. This will be his last Planning Commission meeting, and uh, we, uh, we uh, definitely appreciate his service and uh, that he's given to the town. Ed will stay on the... Uh, uh, stormwater board as a member at large and uh, so we wish him well and uh, uh, in retirement I appreciate all the uh, things that the uh, people in this uh, commission have done and how well we have worked over these last dozen years but time comes when it's time to go on okay again we appreciate your service Ed Anybody else on the Planning Commission have any questions or comments at this point? Anybody in the audience have anything that's not on the agenda? Okay. Um, approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a um, couple of items. Yeah, that we have a couple changes. that are mm -hmm. postponed. Items number seven and eight <clears throat> have been postponed at the request of the applicant. Oh, okay. Hey. Do I have a uh, motion for that, please? Okay. Motion to approve the uh, amended agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item number three, approval of the minutes of the May 16th, 2019 meeting. Do we have any changes to this? Not, not that I know of. Motion to approve as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item number four, discussion and public hearing on a right-of-way permits for fiber optic cable to be installed along portions of North and South Watt Road, Old Stage Road, McPhee Road, Boyd Station Road, Virtue Road, Parkside Drive, Grigsby Chapel Road, Fritz Road, and Smith Road. MCI Metro Access Transmission Services Incorporated applicant. Well, this is obviously, as you can see on the screen, a very big project. Um, this is like a town image of the overall project. The uh, <clears throat> the lines in red, let me turn the lights off. You might be able to see this a little better if that's all right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Still, still hard to see those lines, but um, the lines uh, that are in the red would be um, underground, and then the blue is over 
overhead existing overhead utility lines that they'll be utilizing. Um, it's a, a very big project, obviously. It encompasses a large portion of the town's rights of ways. Um, the, um, the applicant is here to talk through, I think, the, the project, the phasing, um, the subject twos at your places. There were eight of those. Um, and I can just go through those real quick. Um, the applicant has indicated they are okay with these. Um, anything that's installed underground uh, needs to be through directional boring, not open trenches and uh, anything like that. Um, secondly, there will be a letter of credit that will be required in the amount of 20000 uh, for this project. Um, and that would not be released until the entire project is finished and everything has been completely restored to its pre um, installation condition. Um, the uh, third item would be that uh, they're cognizant about pedestrian facilities, other utilities, you, um, irrigation and landscaping to try to avoid disruption to any of those. Um, that uh, all the work either has to be within existing rights of ways or the 10 foot easement that's typically outside of the right of way. Um, that any affected entities will be properly notified um, that there's a pre construction meeting for each phase of work with our engineering department to make sure that um, they talk through kind of the project for that particular area. Um, any, you know, you know, interesting things that they might need to be aware of and work together on. Uh, for example, traffic control, which is the uh, number seven there, just making sure that we have proper traffic control in place um, and that we're coordinating the work with perhaps other projects that might be going on at the same time, like there's some work out at Watt Road, uh, for example. Uh, through TDOT. And then finally on uh, comment eight was, um, you know, uh, there is an extension that's shown to the cell tower that's on the town's public works property. My understanding is this applicant is taking the fiber to the property line to the edge of the right of way and then another entity at some point in the future would extend to the to the existing cell tower and they would be within an existing platted easement that's on the town's property but that would have to be you know verified obviously before that that portion would occur but that's that's a separate project so um, I'll just uh, with that turn it over to the applicant and they can maybe walk through this we do have you know, sections of the plan that are broken down, more or less starting from the east side of the town, from Parkside Drive, coming through to the west. <clears throat> uh, it will follow, um, you know, Grigsby Chapel Road. Again, part of this is overhead utilities, part of it's underground. Um, moving on, coming down through Smith Road, down Everett, and uh, and through uh, under Kingston Pike to the west on um, Old Stage Road and then back up north to uh, Watt Road. Then in the southwest part of the town, uh, it would be going down McPhee Road to Evans and then part of it would be going north along Virtue and then south Virtue and then coming more or less due southwest along Boyd Station Road. So that's kind of a, an overview of the project as far as the areas involved. And uh, like I say, I can turn it over to the applicant and they can maybe walk you through this in more detail or if you have any questions. Mark, I've got a general uh, question. Yes, sir. Uh, do we have a requirement for how much advance notice be given? Is it seven days or? Not to my knowledge, any, not any to my knowledge. There might be for the right-of-way permit that's handled through engineering. I'd have to double check on that. But it's notification There's, for any affected party, number five, for instance, we don't have any. Set, not set anything that I'm aware of. Notification. No. Mm -hmm. 
That would be good to have so we could put it on the website and on social media, kind of warn uh, app, uh, the uh, area that uh, something's fixing to happen in their area so they'd know that uh, to leave a little bit earlier or to uh, go another way. Yeah. That was one of the things that we asked them to include was kind of a general timeline of different portions of the project, which was included in your packet. Um, and uh, again, they, I think they could speak to that in more detail and what their public outreach efforts are. Uh, this is the same um, contractor, I believe, that did the uh, underground fiber installation along Kingston Pike from uh, Costco West to uh, Concord Baptist Church uh, a few months ago. So it's that, that's kind of what this would involve to a, a little bit larger scale. Give us your name and an address and uh, your business. Michael Sides, Foresight Group. I'm a subcontractor for the engineering firm uh, for MCI Metro for this project. And uh, I'm from Athens, Alabama. An address for the company? Um, Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mike, Mike, I'm the outside plan engineer for MCI. Can you Horizon come up to the microphone, please? In Knoxville area. Um, our business address is 603 Warehouse Park Lane, Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay, thank you. Do you guys have any questions about the uh, build plan itself? Uh, I have a question. Uh, the drawings that are shown here shows a little section on Kingston Pike at the intersection of Watt Road going west, but I couldn't see that anywhere on the permits or on the description. Um, that little tab going next to the legend box. This section on this print here? Yeah, I didn't see that anywhere in the permitting. Uh, that may be, a, uh, that should be on one of the permit applications. I, I'm not sure if uh, Mark has included all the individual permits in the package. I include all that I, all that I have. Um, there's quite a few, obviously, uh, for this project, and that was, I think, one of my comments um, a couple of weeks ago was just making sure that, you know, we had er the application to address each aspect of the project. So I think what John's talking about, I guess, is this section over here. Yeah. That's exactly it, so and I couldn't I'm find anywhere in the road. description, either in the description that you had provided, yeah. nor could I find it in the permits that described that section there on Kingston Pike. Okay, well, um, I believe we'll have to review that. We should have sent that over with the packet, the original packet submitted. The question I have is, uh, how do you determine what side of the road you're going <coughs> to? Uh, a lot of factors, uh, available right-of-way space, uh, existing utilities. Would you mind speaking into the microphone, please? Sorry. Existing utilities in the, in the area, depending on uh, what side of the road they're on, we may want to work around those or work with those, depending on how much space is available. And, our, and Mark, our permitting, we don't care, really, whether it's one side or the other? Where would be the, have the least disruption? I mean, is recommended, but it uh, as long as they do the, you know, use directional boring and minimize any damage to, you know, infrastructure and and people that are abutting the affected property, then um, you know we're it. We don't really have a requirement that you have to be on a certain side of of a right of way, for example. Okay. And my last question is, on Grigsby Chapel Road, uh, a part of it is underground and a part of it is aerial. And it looked like aerial physically is available, so I was curious as to what made the determination that you switch from one to the other. Uh, typically, it's just a cost analysis of depending on uh, make ready that has to be done on each individual pole. Uh, if it looks like there's going to be a lot of movement that has to happen, we don't want to disrupt other services or uh, potentially replace a lot of poles unnecessarily so we just do a cost analysis of whether underground versus aerial is most beneficial okay and actually I said that was my last question but it's not I got one more <laughs> uh, when I looked at the routing and I was in Turkey Creek area in front of Verizon the Verizon store and in front of Marshalls there's some 
pipe sticking out of the ground where there's already installed? There's already been some digging there. Is that your work or is that somebody else? Um, it's possible. I believe the, so we have built up two sections outside of the city limits along Turkey Creek. This is into Farragut, a couple hundred yards in Farragut. Oh, I'm, that I'm not sure. Uh, that could be, it could be another provider. All of our, um, <clears throat> all of please, our please speak we, into the microphone, yes, would you please? please. Um, sorry, Mike, Mike again with MCI Verizon. Um, all the all the work we originally were permitted on, uh, which was all along Kingston Pike, uh, just a little bit under two miles. Um, that has been completed and cleaned up. So I would forge to say it is not our, it is not our stuff. Uh, what he's referencing is on, over on uh, Parkside Drive, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Parkside Drive, yeah. in front of the Verizon store and in front of the Marshall store, along your proposed route for this particular cable, there's fresh cable sticking out of the ground in two locations there where some underground drilling has been already done. I'm yes. Curious. Yes, sir. Yes. We have um, started to build Parkside Drive. Um, I think there might have been a situation where we crossed into the Farragut by one of our crews, which as soon as we realized this, we, we stopped so, that construction. So that's a oops. <clears throat> it could be an oops, <laughs> okay. yes, sir. Or it could be another party. I would really need to look at it. But Thank you. How do you go about um, notification? We have several neighborhoods that are going to be um, affected by this. How do you go about notifying these neighborhoods? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. So um, generally speaking, when Mark grants us a permit um, and we know when we're going to start that project, we will send out um, a, a supervisor from Maztec, which is our prime contractor here in the Knoxville vicinity. Um, and they will actually door tag every residential door along that route. Okay. And how much in advance do you, would you anticipate? Those Usually, door within tags? Um, what we do is we call in locate, so we we know we got 72 hours to kill. Um, so that's when we door tag. Mark was was the staff satisfied with the previous stabilization efforts that occurred during the spring with the with the same applicant um yeah i mean i would have to have a discussion with you know the field crew from engineering um it was obviously a wet time of the year we had another utility that was also working in the general area a lot of it and uh so there was some areas that uh, were messed up pretty bad for a while i think a lot of that was the other utility that was working um, in the area um, what I've personally seen I've I, I've been satisfied with it um, I haven't seen any you know major issues uh, the the worst issues that I personally saw was up at uh, Jamestown and, uh, and that may have been Kingston our, Pike our local area. gas provider that may have done some of that yeah, and it was, again, it was uh, a lot of rain and uh, wet conditions, uh, but yeah, then they have a lot bigger um, line that they right. were putting in. This is generally a four-inch bore with a two-inch conduit uh, for this project, I believe, and it, it would be at least 36 inches in depth. Uh, so the only places that should have any disturbances where they have to daylight, you know, uh, the project. So... Uh, but that's again what the letter of credit one thing we'll do before we release the ten thousand dollar letter of credit that we obtained for that work along kingston pike is we'll i'll have uh, i'll ask the engineering staff and 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 i can join them if need be to you know check that route and make sure everything is you know back to uh, the pre-installation condition and um, and then we'll be able to release that one so and we would do the same with this one it's a, a, a larger dollar amount, obviously, because it's a bigger project, um, but we wouldn't release or, or likely even lower the letter of credit until all those areas have been, you know, restored to their previous condition. All right. Thank you. 
And what's the anticipated overall time to complete this project? Um, well, we're prepared to start this project um, immediately after we receive permits. And of course, we'll be getting, you know, section, uh, mark what issue as a permit or, or actually the permitting department will. And, um, you know, we will, we will start that work, you know, within three days. As soon as, as soon as we know we're good to go, we'll call in locates, we'll tag doors in that area. So we're, we're anticipating no longer than 90 days to be d done with this entire row. Entire Cleaned row. up. Will you be working on more than <clears throat> one section at a time? If, if we're permitted to, yes. Yes, we, we would prefer to get done, cleaned up, and out of here uh, as soon as possible. Any more questions or comments? Do I have a motion? Motion approved the right-of-way permits for the fiber optic cable to be installed along all the streets, which I'm not going to re rename, uh, subject to the eight items as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Get back to us on that uh, Parkside Drive, please. Yes, sir, absolutely. Thank you. Item number five, discussion in public hearing on a site plan for small cell support structures at 633 Heron Road and 11473 Parkside Drive, Maztec, AT&T Mobility Applicant. Uh, this request involves, um, actually, the original application had three locations, uh, but one of them we found was in the city of Knoxville, so obviously that they'd have to go through them on that. Um, the two locations, and that's the one that's in the city, uh, they're at 11313 Parkside Drive. The two locations that are proposed in the town, um, the first is um, toward the end of Heron Road, uh, at 633 Heron Road, and then the second one is uh, at 11473 Parkside Drive, and that's generally the area where you, the eastern access to the Best Buy shopping center is. Um, so that's the general area for these two. Um, the uh, the comments that the staff have uh, are at your places. Some of these are similar to the fiber project that you just uh, reviewed. Um, I would say this on these small cell support structures. Um, as you all know, we spent a lot of time um, really creating or a new ordinance uh, to try to address these and get ahead of uh, most other communities, frankly. Uh, with these small cell support structures. They're not a cell tower. Um, what they are is just a, a kind of a, they're a smaller version, I guess, of a cell tower uh, that you typically see in areas where there's a lot of cell phone activity or there might be some, um, you know, poor coverage for whatever reason. Um, and. Uh, we're probably going to be seeing a lot more of these uh, throughout the whole area, the whole country. Um, when we uh, created our telecommunications provisions, we had an expert in the field help us, Larry Perry. I know you all remember uh, his guidance through our process. Um, and he, uh, you know, worked with the staff and you all and the Board of Mayor and Alderman to try to, to make sure the the regulations we put in place uh, were consistent uh, with state law and federal law because to some extent the town we can only do so many things in this arena of regulation because the state and the federal law supersedes what the town can do in fact uh, shortly after we adopted our ordinance the state created a new telecommunications provisions that nullified many of our provisions um, which we will be changing and updating uh, the only concern I have with that is once we do that something else is going to change and that's going to be <laughs> need to be revised so it's a it's a constantly evolving arena um, 
but I did want to mention that communities can't just say you can't have these or you you know you you, you can regulate them out you can't do that you, you do have to provide for them you can't treat them any different than other utilities like electric power um, you know gas whatever uh, so there are certain things that the town you know can and cannot do the subject to is that that I had in relation to to these locations um, and let me just go through those first of all the polls proposed uh, this is the one at Heron Road uh, they are in the public right-of-way um, the pole itself is 32 feet in height uh, roughly the diameter is 8 inches the antenna diameter is about 12 inches at the top uh, if you remember um, the structures that were placed on Parkside Drive and Campbell Lakes Drive for Zayo about three years ago were m much more uh, obtrusive, frankly. I mean, this is a much more stealth design than what those were. You could see the attachments more uh, with the Zayo structures. Um, and as you can see, the pole is actually slightly lower in height in comparison to that uh, overhead utility pole. So that's kind of what they're proposing out there on the Heron Road location and I'll review the Parkside Drive one here in a minute but some of the comments that remain uh, you know we to my knowledge fiber optics have not been extended to either location at this point and that will have to come before you all uh, at some point my understanding from the applicant is until they they get a um, an agreement on location for these small cell structures um, they don't like to order the fiber the installation so that's that's what i've been told um, the other things here are basically just making sure that um, all the structures are underground or within the pole that's what number two is talking about to to make sure that there's not any uh, above ground structures related to this that there's no interference with pedestrian facilities driveways utilities irrigation landscaping those kind of things um, that there is proper notification provided to all affected entities uh, for this um, we would have a pre-construction meeting at each of these locations um, with the town staff to make sure everybody's clear on the project um, that the affected parties in this case it's just two locations that they uh, know about the project and its parameters and so forth uh, that the traffic control plans as applicable are in place uh, there's not any visibility obstructions created that the structures are in the existing right-of-way um, I will need to talk with the town attorney about the the proposed structure on Parkside Drive because ultimately that will be a replacement light pole similar to what Zayo did um, what we are recommending consistent with the town's telecommunication provisions uh, are that the <coughs> location proposed on Heron Road uh, be reconsidered and they move that to a location on Parkside Drive um, the uh, <clears throat> this would be consistent with the recommended hierarchy that's in our provisions basically when an applicant is looking at the placement of these structures they need to first go to the more intense zoning districts or busy land, uh, street system so for example Parkside Drive is mostly zoned regional commercial as opposed to Heron Road which is mostly zoned residential and residential is the least recommended location for these type of structures and then secondly Heron Road is a collector street as opposed to Parkside Drive which is a major arterial street so that would be consistent with the town's hierarchy for the placement of these type of structures um, I was told through an email by the applicant that for some reason they they could not place it on Parkside Drive I think that does need to be conveyed to the town as to why specifically um, 
and certainly at a minimum if that's in fact the case the structure should be moved to the very end of Heron Road still in the public right-of-way um, let me show you there's I took a couple of pictures this is roughly the pole where they're proposing to put the, the structure it would be about five feet from the curb in between the street edge and the pole the utility pole and then the the pole to the north of that <coughs> that's still in the public right-of-way uh, would be where the staff is recommending it as a worst case scenario if they can't relocate it to Parkside Drive um, there are some trees in the general area that might be disturbed as a result of that work uh, I'm not sure uh, but uh, I think if they could situate it back there again worst case scenario I believe it would be pretty hidden um, there's a lot of existing vegetation as you can see in that area so and it's right pretty much right before you get to the retaining wall um, for JC Penney so and then in, in regards to the uh, structure proposed on Parkside Drive <clears throat> let's see that one as I mentioned earlier it's uh, over near the Best Buy shopping center in order to avoid a situation where two poles are essentially 35 feet from each other in an area where you have underground utilities we're asking the applicant and actually recommending as a requirement that they um, put their small cell structure on the uh, light pole uh, they would have to replace the light pole in order to handle that additional weight um, and it's been conveyed to me that they are okay with that and they are pursuing that for that particular location um, and then the town would need to have some kind of um, you know lease agreement with the applicant for that and that's what that was talking about um, in regards to my discussions with the town attorney and uh, finally the letter of credit uh, would be required for the project of five thousand dollars to make sure that any areas that are disturbed if there are any uh, they're restored to their pre-disturbed condition um, so that's uh, kind of an overview of what's being requested here and the staff's recommendation on those things um, we do have a number of people that have signed up to speak on this item um, I don't know if y'all have any questions I'm not sure if mr. Youngblood is here the applicant okay well he certainly knew about it so <laughs> I've sent Mark, two or I three a, emails about it I have a question on the Heron Road uh, yes the first question is uh, there's a pole utility existing utility pole right adjacent to where they're proposing the new pole and is yes, is there some reason that we shouldn't ask that they can mount that antenna on top of that existing pole? I did they can't do it for clearance reasons which that is valid that that you know, I, I okay. mean that's a valid issue and, and the other your request to move it to the end of the road yes have you got any response to that request no hmm no response and applicants not here this is something that you all do need to take action on one way or the other I mean you do need to vote it up or down or vote it with conditions however you want to handle that but we don't need to postpone it we do need to take action on it the proposed pole is is right next to that pole and both of those poles will be right in that residents front yard yep. so I'm simp I'm sympathetic to having it moved down toward the end yeah. of the street yep and that's again that's the staff's recommendation actually is to move it to Parkside Drive um, and if, if for some reason that is not feasible uh, then at least move it further away from the Martins driveway in this case to the end of the road where it's more hidden um, I thought I heard you say that you had requested the Parkside Drive but the, the response was that was not possible Yep, but they did. did I misunderstand you? Yeah, they didn't elaborate on didn't that. that was the it seems like there should be some justification for that, other than uh, no. Yes, that's what I was hoping they they could speak to tonight. So, well, can we make changes in their proposed plan tonight with them not being here? 
like moving the cell tower to the pole further down in, at, of Heron Road. You can make recommendations like that that would that would be consistent with with state law because you're not prohibiting it. You're just making a recommendation. I think certainly recommending to move it to the end of Heron Road and it you know would seem to me to be well we could make a recommendation fine. that says we prove it like a the parkside location unless they provide sufficient yes. justification to you and the technical staff absolutely and if that's not if you're pleased with that then fall back to that could be a heron road at the end of the road yes period you could do that yes uh, or denial right or denial. i mean yeah i'm just saying if you wanted to take some action on Mm -hmm. But let's hear, I'd rather hear the rest of the comments before we... we I'm, I'm disappointed that they're not here, because I think there's people here that want to speak, and I think yeah, the applicant yes, should be here to hear that. Hear right. I'm a little bit surprised, because I did send the comments I'm, to the applicant. I'm of the opinion that we table <laughs> get the applicant yeah. in here yeah. to listen well, to the comments. I don't think we... We don't want to table it. I, that, I think we're, no, we're no, under no. A, a deadline where we need to take action on it. Yes. Mark, would you elaborate a little bit more? You're using the word recommend, and... To me, that sounds a little dangerous. Right. It, it, can we require? Because that, that's typically what this body does when it comes to details like this and site plans and preliminary plats. We, we have requirements pursuant to our municipal code. Uh, I get concerned if we're just going to make a recommendation and the applicant says, well, we're not going to comply with your recommendation. We're going to do it the way we want to do it. Do we still have a leg to stand on? Um. <clears throat> I'm trying to read through these again. Um, like we'd have to specifically say what we're approving, and either meets it or it doesn't meet it. <laughs> I'm with you on this recommendation. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never heard us. I mean, we've made recommendations regarding zoning, and we recommend that up to the board of mayor and alderman. But I've never heard us use the word exactly. recommend like this in a situation. I mean, like all this. of our, all of my comments are always staff recommends subject. But that's to, your recommendation to us, <laughs> right? Yeah. But ultimately, is this body requiring or recommending? We're approving well, or disapproving. within what you can require, you could certainly do that. And I think as long as you don't overstep the line and you're, you know, I think these these conditions that the staff noted are all conditions that, that um, would be consistent with certainly our provisions and my reading of the state law. So, I mean, we're not prohibiting it um, I think we're making reasonable um, comments uh, that um, are logical to me I mean to me I would think there'd be more need for the pole to be on Parkside both structures to be on Parkside Drive as opposed to one on Heron um, it would seem to me that there'd be more activity uh, over on Parkside Drive but I don't know. Again, I think you could you could certainly place in your in your action um, that it's on the applicant to demonstrate why the pole cannot be placed on Parkside Drive. I think that's reasonable. Is there already underground on Parkside for this particular applicant? No, not to my knowledge. No. So there's, there's no none on either. Now, well, like I mentioned earlier, the fiber, the, what I was told by the applicant in an email was that they don't usually place an order for fiber unless they know the location for the small cell structures is, is going to be approved. I need some help understanding why we have to take action on this tonight. we got a time constraint. There's a time what, from a limitation to, uh, under state law. Yeah. That we if we to. don't take action, then it's automatically, it's automatically approved. approved. Yeah, okay. As presented, yeah. Yeah, so we have Thank to be careful. Similar to a subdivision plat, if someone hasn't signed a waiver uh, uh -huh. for that, that we have to take action one way or the other. And who, who is the applicant that's not here? Um, that Mastec. was Maztec AT and T Mobility. I mean. Is uh, Mastec not your parent company, folks? No, sir. That's a different entity. Yeah. Mark, no, who it's actually a different, uh, own the tower? I thought I heard you say um, AT&T, to my knowledge, is 
would be the, the one. one. Would be the one. I would be happy to come Mike, Mike, uh, with um, MCI Verizon. MCI. So, Maztec is our prime contractor. Um, Maztec does just like Verizon. We have Verizon Wireless, um, and Maztec is the same way. So, um, their wireless division does work for. Verizon, AT&T, and all those different companies, but but they're a contractor completely. So. Okay, thank you. Help help me out here. Uh, who didn't show up, AT&T or Mastec? Well, the applicant was probably Mast their engineer who drew the plan is normally the one that would be here to present. Kevin this Youngblood is yeah. Kevin Blood Youngblood is the sure. gentleman I've been emailing and communicating Youngblood. with throughout the process. Yeah, and he's with Mass Tech. On the application. He's Mass Tech, you said? Mm-hmm. And he had all this, the staff subject twos ahead of time, just like they did. Did uh, you have any reason to believe that he would not be here? Hmm. Did you have any reason to believe he would be here? <laughs> well, other than... Maybe Other than, uh, well, you know, I'm just wondering if there's some legitimate reason why. Not you know, to my I mean, knowledge. There can be excusable reasons why. Well, do you know where he's located? I think they're out of Murfreesboro, I believe. Well, my thought is we've got a lot of folks that are here tonight that have um, some thoughts they'd like to share. Let's let's hear hear what yeah, our citizens have to say, and maybe it'll help guide us in some decision making. We, and we can pass these comments along to him as well. Is that right? Sure. Absolutely. Yep. Just keep in mind, you know, there's certain limitations to what we can do. I, I think what the staff's recommending is are reasonable suggestions, um, and uh, they can be in the form of a requirement until someone can prove otherwise, I would suspect. I don't think that's a problem. Um, but if they do present evidence that they need a pole in the Heron Road location, um, then it is something that would have to be approved. Uh, now we can hope that they'll, you know, put it at the very end of the road, as we suggest. And um, does that come back to us? Um, it depends. I'm not sure. It depends um, on how we worded it. Though. Yeah, I think Emotion. it really depends on how you act on it. Yeah. Well, regardless, we're working under a timing deadline. Right. Right. So we need the input from the citizens. I think if they don't adhere to the recommendation, then I would recommend that it come back to you all. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out, and Mark touched on it briefly, but just to put it in real layman's terms, both legislation, recent legislation out of Nashville and Washington, D.C., have somewhat tied our hands in what we can and cannot approve uh, when it comes to, to cell towers and small cell structures and so forth because they have um, now been designated uh, basically as much authority as what a utility or other municipalities have. So I think as we're working through this, and I kind of keep that in the back of your mind, there's uh, in a perfect world, we could just say, no, you can't do this. But I don't think that, um, especially with some of the, the recent legislation, which both out of D.C. and Nashville, we do not have the authority to be able to just absolutely say no. Right. Yeah. All right. I agree. Well, That's and true. Mark, go tell a little bit about the timing of it, too. Of If we don't do anything, there's a deadline. Yeah, well, you, you'll you have to act. I mean, you all have to act tonight. You need to vote it up or down. Suppose in the worst-case scenario, we denied it tonight. Then do they have you have the, to have reasons for denying. Right. And then... Uh, him not being here is not legitimate a reason. reasons. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Logical reasons for denial. Right. And... Uh, we're and then, we're you know, we'll, we we'll get back with Could the applicant apply? and... Uh, hmm. They could reapply. Yeah, they can always come back and present whatever necessary evidence that right. they need to present for their okay. case. All right. I'm, like I said, I'm kind of surprised that no one's here because yeah. they certainly knew that there were some 
concerns and recommendations that involve the placement of at least do one you, of these structures. Do you happen to know offhand how long the, your recommendations have been in their hands? I, there's been several emails about different recommendations. I mean, well, I I'm sent the staff recommendations about... two days ago for two days ago. meeting, uh -huh. but I've also emailed the applicant a couple of times prior to that you know, and they know about this. Well, it's the Heron Road uh, Parkside Drive issue that's obviously of more concern right. here, it seems. Yep. So that's, I just wonder how long they've had to consider that recommendation. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it at the staff developer meeting, meeting. actually. Okay. Yeah, when they didn't have one, anyone well, for that I mean, either. It's not just been sprung on them right that was yeah. that was also noted to them that we would be talking about that request at the staff developer meeting okay and that was over two weeks ago so all right that sounds like ample time did our clock for action start on the may the 23rd when you received the packet or the date they sent it supposedly or dated it you um, received i hope original application Whatever the yeah, original when application, the application was, application kind of when the is, May the 23rd was what was yeah. your receipt day. Yeah, when it's submitted and deemed to be complete, then you that, know, yeah. that's when it, the clock starts. Mm -hmm. uh, does it extend after, if depending on what we, if we were to deny it, does that, at that point, does it start over again? What's the uh, timing on that? I'd have to look at the state law on that because um, it actually is a little different than the towns. Um, but um, there is a there is a clock that starts over, and uh, but um, it uh, I'm not sure exactly what that. Come out for the appeals is process? Is that kind of what no, you're referring to? No, just for resubmittal and re okay approval, I guess or. Yeah, I can't remember what that. What how many days that one is? Yeah. Can we hear some of the comments? Yeah, yeah. Let me. Yeah. I'll try to check on that while you're while we're listening here. Um, the first person I think is Patrick Hayes. Patrick Hayes. Is that right? I couldn't hardly read that. And after Patrick is Laura Fang Fangman. Fangman. Um, my concerns are, are with uh, the health of a residential community. Uh, just oh. just going online to the internet. Oh, oh do you if have you my would, address? And address? We, we would like your name and address. Oh, yes, Patrick sir. Edward Hayes. It's eleven three one seven Gates Mill Drive. Thank yeah. you, sir. Appreciate and it. And Sweet also, yeah. okay. Mark, can you start right the down timer? street from where the proposed Heron Road Tower would be? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, you can go online and find tens of studies that basically talk about the deleterious effects, the bad effects of radiation, even low-level uh, electromagnetic radiation. Um, one of them from the American Academy of Pediatrics and then many international ones. We don't take it, seem to take it as seriously here as Europe has taken it because they've done a lot more research. But uh, if when I look at their studies, and there's lots of them, uh, it, it's apparent that they found deleterious and bad things happening to people within 500 meters of, of that low-level radiation from towers. And so my thought is if there's any way you can get this to be moved as far away from a residential community as you can, that would be a good thing. Um, and I mean, these are well documented. Anybody can go out on the Internet and find it. And uh, um, I'm hearing a lot about from from you folks, or not from you, but from the gentleman at the end there, that you have to do this. You, you're mandated to do this, and you have no choices. But I would say, if you have a choice, as far as the the health issue is concerned, I would I would try to move it as far away from a residential community as you could get it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And uh, the next speaker is Laura Fangman. Can't. Sorry, mispronounced that. 
Hi, good evening. Please, please pull the mic down where you can. Yeah. Or if you give us your first and last <laughs> name, your address. Laura Fangman, uh, 11342 Gates Mill. Um, and I apologize, I wasn't planning on speaking this evening. Uh, I was just making some notes kind of as things went along. Um, obviously, I'm in the neighborhood that's impacted by this. I'm not real interested in having another tower as part of the neighborhood. Um, I feel like it's a slippery slope. There's already a, a power pole there. There's a lot going on. There's a, a small utility box. Now we're going to add another cell tower. I think that it's very difficult to um, not imagine that in the future another company wants to add something else. Well, let's just add it right there because we've already got this other stuff. We'll put it by the other poles. Um, that is most certainly going to impact property values, not just for the front yard that it falls into. Nobody wants to drive past that. Um, so I think that future permits like this should be considered when we talk about putting them in that space right there. Um, it, <laughs> he mentioned a, a $5,000 letter of credit, which I assume is if they don't fix things, you keep their money and pay to have it fixed. Mm -hmm. $5,000 is grossly insufficient based on what I understand will have to happen. Um, and once this is approved, then they're going to permit for, it sounds like, fiber, which is now going to tear up more and impact more people's property to get that second piece done once we get the first piece approved. So I think that there's some future ramifications as well. Um, and I also think that not showing up tonight is pretty indicative of how you could expect that process to go. I think you could probably expect that he's not going to do what he says he's going to do. Um, and I think that the company would be more than happy to walk away from $5,000. It's a cost of doing business. So I don't think that they're particularly concerned about the residents or who that might impact. Um, I think, oh, I, I think my neighbor probably can speak a little bit more to it, but if you're looking for a legitimate reason to deny the permit, um, the very basic understanding I have of the process um, is that it requires four pictures, and I see one. So that would be an incomplete application. If, if, in fact, that is correct, if my understanding of that is correct. So someone else can probably speak more to that than I can, but I did want to throw it out there. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fingman, F-E-N-G-M-A-N. Fingman, that's an F. Anybody else? Which is? Yeah. Hold on a second. Try to get to that. Joe Martin. Is there someone after that that can be? Uh, Melissa Martin. Good evening. Joe Martin, 631 Heron Road. My wife, Melissa Martin, is going to join us. Um, I first would point out that the address is probably incomplete, or the uh, application is incomplete because the address is wrong. There's no 633 Heron Road. We're on 631, and we're at the very end. We even checked with the post office, even though I knew the answer. So actually, that's incorrect. Uh, maybe go ahead and speak. This was one of my speaking points, but maybe go ahead and point out a little bit. So in the application process, it does say that there has to be four different angles. Section 13, the Farragut's own application process for small cell structures. It says the photographs should view a shed of each proposed small cell support structure location taken in at least four directions. So as we're pointing out, we're actually not looking at two pictures. We're looking at one picture, uh, which I, I, I kind of remind everybody, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So if you kind of slant your pictures, you kind of slant your angle of what you're trying to achieve. So they superimposed the pole onto the second one, but obviously all you see is uh, the one picture. My wife has some additional pictures. I've Mark, I think you have the, the ability to take pictures and project them up on the screen, if I remember correctly. I don't know why that's... Or we can pass them around. Yeah, you'll have to pass them around. Okay. I'm so we have additional pictures to show how this impacts us and... My friends here in Sweetbriar that also showed up because, quite honestly, it's in my front yard. So uh, obviously it's the aesthetics concern from my standpoint of looking at this from my front porch, from my driveway, and my neighbors in Sweetbriar who has to stop and look at that every day as they, they travel at that stop sign to travel uh, towards here on Heron Road. Of course, as I already mentioned, the property value. Uh, I have concern, again, adding something else that's going to impact our property value. Uh, the health concerns, uh, I actually did the same thing myself, read a little bit. Uh, I, I know 
conspiracy theory on internet. Don't believe everything you read, but there is a lot of the good document uh, studies that have been conducted. If you get bored, go read about the one in the school in California that had the same problem with four children uh, developing cancer because they allowed a cell structure on the school property. Um, I would point out that the fact that we also have lived this three other times in interruption on our property. Uh, flashback to when J.C. Penney's was built, they cut my driveway to put a sewer pipe in. Uh, the second time, we had a buried box for telecommunications. Uh, we had a new pole. That's actually been replaced about two years ago. That was a wooden pole there originally. Um, and every time, I was told that would be replaced back to its current state. I'm a pretty particular homeowner, i.e. yard guy. And every time that that was done, I'm the one that actually had to go in to do the final grade and correction because it was never done satisfactory, and I fixed it. So I have concerns on that. Um, you know, I guess... From my perspective and going back and reading, and I think, Mark, this was the uh, communication that you had back and forth with Mr. Youngblood, but you even mentioned this isn't a residential area. So I would also bring up the fact that why would we allow this in a residential area? Parkside's a perfect opportunity, perfect place for it. And even if we do a secondary placement, which I did think of, which was pointed out by Mark, the second power pole that's uh, closer to J.C. Penney's proximity, but you still have the aesthetics issue, you still have the health concern issues, you still have everything else. At least it's not in my front yard. I guess instead of NIMBY, it's NIMPHY, if anybody knows the acronym, not in my front yard. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my wife and let her talk a little bit about it as well. Hey there, I'm Melissa Martin, 631 Heron Road, here in the big town of Farragut. Um, I've got some photos, I would kind of just like to I made two sets so y'all can start on either end, and if you don't mind, we can go through them and kind of look at them together. Sure. And I kind of put on the back what it was, um, but this first photo is actually me standing on my front porch, and I can see that power. We need you to talk from the microphone, please. I can't see the pictures. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> well, maybe you can show them to me from this one. Um, <laughs> In the, the first one, I'm standing on my on my porch looking at that pole. So to be looking at another big cell tower isn't something I would exactly like to sit there and do. We plan, you know, we, we've been here a long time, and my grandmother actually graduated from Farragut High School. So we have been long-term Farragutians and have no intention of moving at all. But if we did sometime, I'm sure this would severely impact our ability to sell our home because it's, it's so not nice looking. The second photo I think you have right there is me actually standing where that power pole is looking at my porch. So it, it is very close to my home where this tower would be. And the health concerns, I can't afford to get sick from a radiation tower. Okay, the next one, again, that's on from a little bit on up my driveway, just a pinch. So that would be looking at the tower again. Okay, this is standing at my driveway. We're on the very right. You can see that tower, and it's kind of a shot angled like you're going to be looking down to where the other pole is towards the J.C. Penney's. And right now in the summer, it does look like there's a lot of vegetation there. But when the fall comes and the, the trees lose their leaves, it will still be an eyesore because it's not that far away. And right there where that intersection is, the majority of Sweet Briar traffic comes up Heron Road and turns right on Gates Mill. So it's going to be right there. It's still in a big viewing area for all of us. Okay, let's see. That is actually the second pole um, that Mark had shown the slide of that's up near the wall where they are. the town is making their recommendation to put, to put the cell phone tower. Okay, so there is a greenway. If you go to the end of Heron Road, there's some boulders, and you can walk up right behind the big, pretty wall at J.C. Penney's. There is a gigantic holding pond right there. There is a lot of nice, level ground by that holding pond. That would be a great place, in my opinion, to put this tower. If you guys are familiar where the TVA Credit Union is, if you were to walk back about 20 yards, there is a huge holding pond there. There's a nice wooden fence up there that was put in. 
all that space there, that is not a residential area. That has got J.C. Penney's right there. It's got the credit union right there and Panda Express and uh, Tennessee State Bank is all right in that area. That is a shot of the, the Greenway Trail going down just to show that going up where you can't see a lot of residential area to go to where that holding pond is. That is another area, if you're going up the greenway, you can see a fence there on the right, and that's to kind of give the neighborhood a little bit of privacy from all the commercial development on Parkside. So if you were to go on the, the side of Parkside on the other side of the fence there, again, is a good area. The next shot is a picture of, of that fence. Um, the next shot is there right at the edge of the holding pond looking at the Tennessee State Bank. And that is another shot up there. There is a vast amount of property up on the top there. It would not be right alongside Parkside Road as to be an eyesore there, but it would give a little bit of space to where it could maybe sit back just a little bit, but not impinge on a neighborhood and, and folks living there. Like my husband did say, um, the application and also the site map, it um, had 633 Heron Road on it, which is not a valid address with the United States Postal Service. That land is our land, and it doesn't go any further on that road than 631. And I'm not really sure, had it not been for one of our neighbors, we actually had no idea that this was being proposed in our front yard. We didn't see it anywhere in the Farragut Press Enterprise. It, it was for one of our neighbors that came to the town hall for another matter that she got a hold of this map. So I guess I'm kind of concerned if, if, you know, my neighbor wasn't home, I wouldn't have known about any of this going on tonight, and it could have been approved to be right in my yard. So I would ask this um, planning commission, if something like that is directly in somebody's yard, you know, should that resident not be notified prior to something already being approved? Um, I didn't think to check the Farragut website every day. You know, I don't know if that's what we need to do, but I would just, you know, really ask you all to please consider not putting this in our front yard and to move it to, to Parkside. I mean, we, um, we've had a lot of things happen. In my great grandmother's house is where the old Gander Mountain was. So when we moved there, that was just a, a family street. My papa and all his sisters lived on that street and it was a really sweet street. And it's nothing like that now, and I know that change has happened. But I would just ask you all, please don't make this change in my yard. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all, Mark? No, we still got um, Melissa. Oh, no, no. Sorry. I just didn't put that up. Um, Don and Elaine Jackson. Do we have anyone after them? Yeah, I've got three more, I okay. believe. The next one person have them. The next waiting. one after that is John Hoffman. If John, if you'll come in the back over there and be ready to go next. Hi there. My name is Elaine Jackson, and my husband and I live at 11636 Gates Mill Drive. We're literally right across the street from the Martins, and I have to agree with them. We had no idea that this was even being proposed. Uh, there was no letters that came out to maybe um, notify us that there was a possibility. Um, the way I found out is I was backing out of my driveway last week and Joe was putting up his protest sign and notifying everybody that there was a meeting tonight. We didn't even know about the meeting. Um, so I'm very disappointed because we've lived in Farragut for 35 years. And uh, we dealt with David Rogers when you all first started planning Parkside Drive. And we honestly thought about moving away, but I want to thank you for taking away that entrance into Heron Road and not making it a through street from Parkside Drive. That has saved our neighborhood from having all that crazy traffic. Um, but going back to what we're dealing with tonight, um, I don't want a tacky pole in front of their home and across the street from mine. And I'll have to say that I did not do the research that this other gentleman did, but I appreciate that because the radiation and the waves from this tower 
will be detrimental to our health. And my husband is already disabled, and I don't need further disablement. <laughs> it's okay, but it's bad enough. Um, and I don't want to move. I've been there 35 years. I have a beautiful home. We have a cute little fox that apparently loves our front porch and is showing up on our Ring app. And I don't want any more damage done to our neighborhood. They tore up my yard about four years ago. And like Joe said, they don't come back and fix it the way it was. They sprinkle a little grass seed and they throw a little um, pine straw on it and go, I hope your yard looks good. So now we have people that have to come and protect it or, or take care of it for us. Um, but I just beg you like they are, don't put this ugly thing across the street from us. We don't need it. She, Melissa pointed out, there's plenty of places to put this thing. Parkside Drive is a business. Put it on business. Let residential stay residential. We have the sweetest little neighborhood and the best neighbors ever. Keep it that way for us, please. Thank you. And uh, John Hoffman, and after John is Miranda Heath. My name is John Hoffman, 11341 Gates Mill Drive. Um, I've been coming to these meetings for just about 32 years, and I must say this is the first time in all of those meetings where the applicant didn't have the courtesy to come or to provide an explanation for why he couldn't, he or she couldn't be here. I think there's a message in that, and I hope that you will listen to it loud and clear. The message is, um, why do we have any reason to believe what they say or that they will do what they say they will do? They haven't told us why this uh, uh, technical device needs to be where they want to put it. They just said they want to put it there. They haven't told us why it's safe. They haven't addressed safety one way or another. I'm going to assume it's safe, but they haven't addressed it at all. As several of the other speakers have pointed out, including the town staff, there are numerous alternative locations and they haven't given us any reason why those aren't equally appropriate to the one that they have proposed. So specifically, I would like to ask that you, given that you have to take a vote tonight, that you first of all reflect your disappointment that they haven't shown up to address any concerns from anyone, that if we're mandated by state law to approve something, approve placing it out along Parkside Drive and any of the numerous locations that have been pointed out that would be far more suitable. We have no reason to believe those are technically insufficient solutions. So approve that and let them come back to us to uh, uh, consider alternatives if and when that might be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miranda Heath and after her, Ken Chipley. Thank you, Miranda Heath, address 11349 Gates Mill Drive. Um, so I do work in healthcare, and so I would like to, um, just to kind of touch on the radiation, um, if you are concerned that radiation is safe, please look up Marie Curie, and also look at our uh, disabled Y12 workers and those from Bull Run and BWXT and ask them how safe radiation is and ask them if they would want to live next to a cell phone tower after the damage it did when they worked in it. Um, also, I don't understand how it would be um, something that would be outside of the realm of your all's uh, capabilities and possibilities for saying that we're not gonna put this here on Heron because there are signage height restrictions for businesses. There are parking requirements. There are green space requirements inside of um, every public space, you must have so much green space. Um, and Parkside Drive, if these cell phone folks are so concerned about their cell phone tower, all of the cell phone stores are on Parkside Drive. Wouldn't it be lovely for them to look out their windows and say, there is our beautiful cell tower. Um, so I would encourage you guys, I know I said that a little tongue in cheek and I hope that no one took that as disrespectful, but this is really something that would be um, 
a detriment to our neighborhood, a detriment to our health, and um, there are other placements for it. There is no reason that I could see why if something were to be put on Parkside Drive, there are plenty of places, as these fine folks pointed out, no one would even see it. If you put it behind J.C. Penney's, nobody's going to see it. If you put it behind Publix, nobody's going to see it. If you put it at, on Heron Road, everyone here will see it every day, every time we come home, every time we leave to go to work. So please consider that. Thank you. Thank you. And then Carol Christopherson. Uh, real quick, Carol Christofferson, 11320 Gates Mill Drive, and it's I think it's good to see all of you <laughs> again. Uh, I have one uh, real quick comment. I find it absolutely reprehensible that this gentleman didn't even bother to come, and I find a whiff of arrogance and indifference in uh, the, sp uh, the spokesperson not showing up, and if I were you all, I would be pretty insulted. Um, the other thing is that it was just plain dumb luck that a nerdy homeowner looks at the agenda for the planning commission and the alderman, and I'm not calling this person a name, it's me, um, and happen to see the agenda item. And I have kept up for years with what's going on with these cell towers, having come from New Jersey, where they tried to ram a cell tower down the throat of the watershed in New Jersey. So I know about cell towers, and I also, this is a pole. It's not a tower, it's a pole. I don't like the way they have treated the town and the homeowners, uh, treating us as if we have no right in the say uh, no one came knocking on our door to tell us that they were putting in this application for a poll. Um, and I would like to see more communication with my beautiful neighborhood. And these are all my immediate neighbors. And I'm telling you, every one of them are fabulous people. And we don't want a cell tower in a place that it doesn't have to be when there are other places it can go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned in the packet overview of this item, um, if the application was deemed to be incomplete, which at this point I would recommend that it is incomplete, that it be denied, that would be what I would recommend at the staff level. The applicant certainly has the ability to come back and present us with the requested information that would help us to make a reasonable assessment of where this whole could uh, be located uh, but I think in the absence of that information the application would seem to me to be incomplete and should be denied what does that do to the timetable um, yeah I was reading through that I'm gonna have to read through all that because the state law is so poorly written frankly uh, on that it's it's confusing um, but um, you know, I certainly you can you can recommend denial for something that's incomplete, and then if they don't submit the supplemental information within 30 days, then the the application itself can be completely denied, and uh, they would have to start over. So I think this gives them an opportunity to provide us with the requested information because I think it's reasonable information. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't think what we're requesting is inconsistent with the state law. We're not saying you can't place it in our community. All we're doing is saying we need good information as to you know why you need the structure and the location you're proposing. And if they can provide that, that's that's perfectly acceptable, uh, but I think at this point it would it would be incomplete uh, application. I think uh, start off with it is incomplete. Uh, I mean, we know five G is on the way, and, and it's going to require these these uh, these things. Uh, we've already got them on Parkside Drive. 
Uh, the other applicants were uh, smart enough to give us complete uh, applications, and we have them on Parkside Drive. I, this is a uh, kind of an unusual uh, request, to say the least, and it's incomplete. So I think we need a motion. Mark, is, <clears throat> do we have to make a motion for approval and then vote nay, or do we need, can we make a negative motion? <laughs> I'm always a little unclear about that. <laughs> no, it's come up before, and I don't want to go down that road again. I, just want, before we... I don't know if David has a... It, it, it. Make a ne you can make a negative right. motion, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking at item... Wait just a second. Okay. I have one more comment. I'm looking at item number 11, jumping ahead a bit. Yes. And I think this falls in very directly into that category of just how many comments are needed before an item is, an uh, application is incomplete. Here we've got 11 comments and one very significant, number nine, and then one of, or a couple of the applicants noted that the address is not even correct. Uh, I think we've got more than sufficient reason to make a motion to deny this on incompletion. Is that a motion? I make such a motion. Get that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. If I receive supplemental information, I will notify the as many people as I can. Certainly, if I notify Carol, I'm sure she can take care of it. <laughs> she, so I, I'll notify her and she can. Uh, it's not a requirement um, to notify uh, on a matter like this. Um, that I'm not saying that's right. Um, I, it's, it's not like a rezoning. Um, and frankly, we didn't get this location until just very recently ourselves at the staff level. It kind of caught me off guard. I was surprised that someone was requesting a structure uh, in this area since it is residential. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, it would seem to me the pole would be better suited in an area where there's more cell phone activity uh, on Parkside Drive. But again, you know, we don't have enough information at this point to to make that kind of assessment. So I think that's why one big reason why this is inadequate at this point. Well, is, could you, uh, do you have the information to give like Carol and anybody else who wants to look up the state uh, requirements? Or the I can get that to them. Okay. Yeah, it's good reading. It's, it's good. <laughs> So, and then there's there's federal on top of that. So yeah, um, yeah. But again, you know, we are constrained within. We can't do anything that exceeds the, what the state allows us to do. And so, like the directional uh, request that someone had mentioned, that's we can't really do that. Even though our ordinance says that the state law supersedes that, and there's certain things that we're limited on. So. When we review an application, we have to not only compare it to our provisions, but we also have to make sure that it's not inconsistent with the state provisions. Zayo was, was capable of, of giving us that, and I think this uh, applicant should as well. Yeah, well, it, the state laws changed since Zayo as well. So, you know, we've, we've become a little more constrained with what we can do as a result of some of the changes that have occurred at the state level. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, Sweetbriar, can you hear me? Sweetbriar is not a bunch of NIMBYs. We are not NIMBYs. Every one of us are grateful for our cell phones every day, and we want good cell service. Um, that is not the issue. So just make sure that nobody put words puts words in our mouths that we're a bunch of NIMBYs who came in saying, not in my backyard. We want this done right. It does not have to be there, as far as we're concerned, that there are other places. So I just want to make sure that that doesn't get out. Thank you all for coming. Let me make, let me make one general comment. I think this is just kind of the first instance that's really come up. 
as technology's evolved, we're, the technology's moving to, a, we're going to probably see a lot more of these mm -hmm. in smaller tower type structures. I mean, like even the height of a street sign in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to learn how to accommodate that because we as a computer supply can't just say no. So how to, so this is the first kind of yeah. Uh, yeah, time Mark. we're running into this. So generic comment for all of us is yeah. as we want more technology, it's going to drive it because you're going to have smaller ranges and higher power, and it's going to be, you know, more prolific because you're going to need more of these small, very small structures to uh, to accommodate that. And one thing we we've already approved is that, um, am I right? Still right with the fact that uh, any new neighborhoods we're approving now, they have to have some kind of idea about where they will put these structures within well, these new neighborhoods? we've mentioned that with um, some subdivision requests that have come through. Uh, and in fact, I think that's been a subject to with you all on some of these for them to think about it. But it's, you know, it's such an evolving technology. I don't, yes, you know, who knows, right it now. may be poles this tall by in yep. 10 years. It may not, I don't know, you know, it's, uh, we just know something's coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, there's probably going to be a need for more structures, and but I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Um, it uh, it would be wise to try to, to provide an additional conduit as when you're putting in a development, and I think some of our developers do that. Um, I think we discussed the fact that at least if you know, if you're developing a new subdivision and you're buying into a new subdivision and you know that these things are going to be there and where it is that's helpful it's hard it's hard to regulate that because you don't really know what the future hold the 5g is really only just started and that's started. kind of an experimental stage really um mostly on the west coast in large cities um but we so we really by the time it gets to smaller areas like ours it could be very different than what it is right now. Mark, it seems to me that we need some education, I guess, because in my research for this topic, I, I found that technically the towers can handle more than one carrier, and I don't know what we have their really position is on that, yeah. but for us, we it would be nice to have one tower instead of four towers. Absolutely. So it seems to me that we really need to investigate this a little bit, and as you said, it's going to get worse before it gets better because as 5G comes in, then there's going to be a lot more towers because the the distance is so much shorter with 5G. So it sounds like we need a little education process here uh, for for us here in the commission if we're to make reasonable decisions on this issue as it comes up. Well, also Ran into we that on Parkside Drive, if you remember, uh, some time ago. Yeah. And uh, the answer that I got... Uh, at that time as to whether they could share or not was that they don't really communicate too well and they don't act like they want to share yeah. but well, we maybe have, we have a requirement might for be the larger some towers regulations they can for example in large uh, arenas where they put in the same kind of technology they mm -hmm. all share the same hardware so they, the, can. The they can they yeah, can but they, they don't can. always want so, to do so so my that. position is do we as the town have any voice on whether we can force that to happen or not yeah that, that would be good to know and i don't know what, the answer to that yeah well i could certainly we're not saying it. no <laughs> okay <laughs> we're just saying how about doing it this way yeah and uh, that's that's one where we, we're a little bit uh, uh constrained by uh, the state legislation but you know it's something that um, it could we require that my reading of the state provisions is no could we suggest it and recommend it? Certainly. And if they can work it out, that's fine. But I don't think we could actually require it, as at least as the way I, I read. The My example. We have been fairly successful on the large towers of doing that. Getting the, Yeah, large know, towers are a little different. different We're talking about these small cell support yeah. structures. My example in point is the you location that they're placing a tower in, in Parkside is yeah. about 100 yards away from a Verizon tower that looks just like it. Yeah. So now we got two two antenna towers within 100 yards of each other. Mrs. Martin, did you have something you wanted to add? I did. I just want to make sure I'm totally clear. So I, I know this was denied for now, but the applicant has 30 days 
to make a new application. So is our site still subject to going through this again if he applies again for it to be at our same site? It could be. Absolutely, yes. It yep. could be. Okay, so how will we know? Like, how will we well, know like, if that's happened? Like I said, if I get, I can, you know, if you can get, is your email on here? What, could you email me? Directly? Oh, I will. I'll that's fine. It. Yeah, and I, you and Carol, I think she might have already left. No, she's back there. Okay, yeah. so we, like, I guess we as a, or y'all couldn't say absolutely not to this residential area, but if you want to put it somewhere on Parkside. I mean, that would have to come with the next application because it's dead for now. They would have to show us the burden of proof yeah. to, to, for, us to, to, for us to really be able to determine where they want the tower. And they may have evidence that says, for whatever reason, and we'll take the evidence and have it vetted by the town attorney, that says it has to be in your front yard. And I, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying it could happen. So it is important to be... To stay abreast of what's happening with this, as it piece, this may pan out over a couple of months. Like Mark was saying, we are kind of in uncharted territory when it comes to these small cell structures, and I suspect in the next few years there'll be some case law that kind of supports um, different municipalities because all municipalities are struggling with this, especially when it starts getting into residential areas. And and we've been we kind of knew this was coming a couple of years ago. We started training on it, trying to understand because for, at first we didn't even know what they were. What are these little funny looking little poles? And uh, and now we're trying to figure out exactly what we can and can't do so i guess what we're what we're going to ask of the applicant is you need to prove to us why um, you can't go to parkside drive and if there is some scientific reason that says they have to be in front of your house i mean you're going to want to be involved in that process and that's when it gets real challenging mm -hmm. because we may not have the ability to tell them no if they have and see the problem is we're not sure exactly what that proof is who determines whether the proof this scientific um, reason is even valid. We're not sure. Well, in some of my research I was doing too about the easement, you know, it's essential operations. It's your power. It's your water that would go in easement. A cell phone is not truly an essential to life. You know what I'm saying? To be in easement. That's the, unfortunately, that's what's actually recently changed with the state of Tennessee. Our state legislatures are so now calling that essential. I right. mean, just like electricity wasn't essential a hundred years ago, then it became essential. And then now all of a sudden our, our, our legislatures in, um, slaytors in Nashville are saying, okay, we're going to let cell phone companies fall under the same umbrella as a gas company, electric company, water company, and your sewer company. And that's why we're in uncharted territory. So it's up to them to come back to you all to apply again. Like you don't yes. reach back out to them and say whatever. They come to the town. They to them the action taken tonight, obviously. Yeah. And uh, so well, because I have to under state law, and, and, I, and I would anyway, um, but I'll convey that to them and it's, you know, they have the opportunity to come and submit the information that the staff requested before this meeting uh, for them to mark with their would have they already missed the deadline to get back on the agenda for July or the earliest agenda they would be on would be August well if they resubmit something I will bring it back to in July so it could be the third Thursday in July yep. again we'll know uh, in a few weeks mark will, will put out the agenda um, and that can, you know, there is public notification, but it's in the fine print. I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, if you don't if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, it's easy to miss. And I understand that. Okay, thank is, you. Is it additional information under the same application, or is it a new application they have? It's to just file? supplemental information to the existing. Yeah, I just application. wanted to clarify that yes. for everybody. That's what it is. Now the motion was made by Kyle and seconded by St. Clair. And was was there a motion for seconded all approval? Uh, second, I second it. Mayor. Oh, yeah. Okay, I I missed that. Okay. Could you, uh, Mark, uh, Steve, uh, repeat the complete uh, resolution that you have for the motion, the motion for discussion? I, I just uh, well, it was no, just I, 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 the, the motion was to be denied because of incompleteness. Max wording of it. I hope it's because of an incomplete application. That's yeah, right. it, was. it was incomplete in re especially in regards to you know information to help the commission determine the reasonable location for the Heron Road structure 
in this case. Um, so, you know, and then the, and the apparent the uh, address uh, number apparently address. was wrong, <clears throat> which it's in the public right of way. So it technically doesn't have an address, but it, it you know, it's supposed to pull to the closest address, which apparently was incorrect. So, but there was a 633 that did show up on KGIS. So. Mrs. Martin, would you like your photographs back? So, you, so you don't have to sit through the next agenda items and and wait, <laughs> unless you're really bored. You just really enjoying this. Well, it's either this or watch a dance, Mom. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you for bringing up. Thank, Thank you for coming. There's another one, Mark. And all all approve that, right? Everyone voted in right. the affirmative. Yes. Or that okay. We all approve the denial. No, I'd all. like to have it read. Okay. Yes. All these things are supposed to have been in uh, a current, current right of ways. So, so what's the dispute over there? Yeah, I appreciate it. really need a, to justify something, you need to be have a comparison. Of why or what why it should be or why it shouldn't be. No. Well, we didn't have that. Well, we stated a reason. Yeah. We stated a reason. Yeah. I, I don't yeah, think you have fine. to have a comparison. If it's incomplete, it's incomplete. That's true, but coming yeah. back, if he's mm -hmm. going to come back, mm -hmm. and he says it. Uh, well, Mark, Mark elaborated, and uh, as maker of the motion, I'd be happy to elaborate further if you'd like. On the specifically item number nine, that we would like some explanation as to why the location of that tower must be in a residential area. Period. Rather than commercial. Is that enough comparison? Yeah. Okay. Did you get that, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Motion to amend. Okay. Approve. I mean second. Excuse me. Okay. Let's let's go over this again and get Mark the exact wording that you want. Mark, do you need? Let's state it. State it again. So the motion was to deny. Well, I think I think we need a motion to amend. I, yeah, if I we're going to change the uh, okay. the okay. motion, okay. Who wants to amend that? Well, Ron made the motion to amend, and I yeah. seconded it. I think I I kind of put words in his mouth. I, I guess um, that's why I ask if you want me to make the motion. But you go ahead, Ron, if you'd like. Well, no, go ahead. Just go ahead and complete. I'm going to make a, make a motion to amend the previous motion to specifically say that the application was incomplete because lack of sufficient information concerning the location of the tower uh, that's proposed to be at Heron Road, which is a residential area, rather than uh, on Parkside Drive or other feasible location that is not residential, in addition to the erroneous I get, address yeah. and also the other multitude of uh, items that had not been responded to. In other words, the incompleteness of the application. Okay, I'll, I got that for the most part. Okay, we have a second for that. Second, yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? David, you're, you're frowning back there. <laughs> Address your blood type. <laughs> right, I need to have all that tonight. Uh, David Smoke, town administrator. Um, as y'all have been talking through this issue the last uh, few minutes, I've been reading the state law that has transpired over the last couple of years. I think your first motion 
that you had is the absolute proper motion to make at this time when it comes to incomplete uh, application because it was absolutely incomplete. It didn't have enough information in it. Um, the issue of commercial residential zoning does not matter uh, to the state law. It's in the right of way. And so the right of way is the only thing that really matters according to state law. So I think your original motion of denial based on the fact that it was incomplete is absolutely uh, something that is accurate and can go forward on. We will wait on the applicant. Mark does have to tell the applicant why the basis of the denial was. And that applicant then has whatever time period they want to respond. But once they respond, then we have so many days before it has to come back to this body to then take it up as part of that part of that issue. So I think it's important that you made that motion first. It was absolutely correct. Uh, I think we may want to just stick with that motion if that's possible uh, from the Planning Commission. And then you probably will see this again down the road uh, based on the hopefully a better location for that Heron Road spot. Um, but we'll have to wait and see what the applicant says. So for the timing wise, when they resubmit it, it, it starts again from that point. Um, so they already have a, an open application, let's say. So whenever they respond back to Mark, this body will have 30 days to make a determination okay. of, of the val of validity of that application. Okay, so we don't have to go back to the original date or anything. So actually it would be July then when we have to act on it again. Well, it depends on when they, when they re all resubmit on when some they of the resubmit. details. Okay. That's yeah. right. Hearing out of this is, Roseanne, you may want to amend your amended motion. <laughs> we well, or you may like want to make a motion to go back to the original motion, right? We need to correct. clean out the mess. We so. need to clean this up. Correct. I would I would go back to your original motion. I move we approve the original motion to deny it based on uh, the fact the application is incomplete. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Okay. Item number six, discussion and public hearing on a final plat for Easton Park, Unit 2, oh, Turkey gosh. Creek Road, west of Briarstone Lane, 23 lots, 8.4 acres, zoned R-3 HFTC GP applicant. Uh, this is uh, platting the remainder of Easton Park uh, across from Anchor Park, uh, the western Portion. There's two cul-de-sacs uh, in this particular um, unit. Uh, they have 22 house lots and one open space lot that kind of goes around the periphery of the development. Um, the remaining comments are mostly dealing with field and paperwork related items. Um, they're still working on some stabilization out there. Um, and then the other items we're dealing mostly with um, verifications and uh, you know letters of credit and things like that. So the staff recommends approval of this plat subject to the uh, seven comments that are at your places. Applicant. Ryan Estabrooks with Site Incorporated. Um, 10215 Technology Drive, Suite 304, Knoxville, Tennessee. Are you in agreement with the uh, subject twos here to, to clean those up? Uh, yes, and uh, we have already actually resubmitted to the town revised plans and addressing some of these besides the, the site stabilization. Those obviously take a little bit of time. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? Motion to approve the final plan for Easton Park Unit 2, Trigger Creek West, uh, Briarstone Lane, 23 lots, subject to items 1 through 7. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you for coming. We appreciate you. you sitting through it. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> okay, moving on to item number 9, discussion on an amendment to the C-1 mixed-use town center portion of the Farragut Zoning Ordinance as a pipe as applied to drive-throughs and menu boards on existing developments with drive-throughs that predate the mixed-use town center land use designation. McDonald's USA LLC applicant. This is for discussion purposes only tonight. 
But you all may remember uh, back actually in August of 2018, uh, you all had a site plan that came before you for some remodeling out at the existing McDonald's. Um, and uh, as part of that, they um, are redoing the um, essentially the exterior of the building and doing some site modifications as well. The site, as you all know, have been out there is uh, pretty packed full of stuff. Um, let me pull up the site here. There's not a lot of space on the site. It's a little over an acre. And uh, so um, when, the, when this was originally developed back in 1985, the, most of the customers would go inside. There was, the drive-through was probably less than 30% of the customer base. And now it's almost flipped the other in the other direction uh, for this particular restaurant. Um, so most people, by by far, uh, are using the drive-through. Uh, so what they're proposing, um, what they would like to do, and they're requesting a text amendment for, is the ability to have um, two menu boards essentially take the existing drive-through lane and and uh, kind of separate it into two two areas there to relieve some of the stacking that the site has uh, so that people can you know get get around the building a little bit more efficiently and safe more safely uh, actually uh, than what you have right now um, as part of this proposal there the uh, taking out some parking spaces where there could be a conflict with a car backing up to someone that's in the stack lane. So like, um, this is gonna work. Must be audio. I don't know what's going on tonight here. Well, across from the drive through lane, there used to be, there would be parking spaces that'll be taken out. Um, and then they're also removing some parking spaces in the northeast corner where that dashed area is. And that will help with the um, traffic flow in that area as far as people entering and exiting uh, the site and minimizing conflicts with people that are in the stack area and utilizing the drive through. Um, this area is in the mixed use town center portion of the C1 zoning district, so it does have specific requirements that govern and drive-throughs. Um, however, obviously this is an existing drive-through facility that's been there for a long time. It predates the mixed-use town center. And so, you know, at the staff level, we feel that Operationally, what they're proposing makes a lot of sense. We think that it enhances the flow of traffic given the, the kind of customer base that they have um, and would be an improvement um, to, the, to the development. Um, but that's gonna require some requested amendments to, the, uh, to that portion of the C1 zoning district. So one option that we put in your packet to consider would be in that drive-through section of the mixed-use town center, maybe add a section seven that gives really you all some, some uh, flexibility to kind of evaluate these existing uh, restaurant facilities that have drive-throughs on a more or less case-by-case -case basis. Um, some restaurants, like uh, my understanding, the Taco Bell, a large portion of their customers go inside. Um, but it, for some reason, uh, on many of the McDonald's, uh, they're more of a drive-through lane user. So, um, so again, this, this provision would give you all some flexibility uh, to evaluate um, conditions um, and then, uh, you know, assess that in terms of the scope of the redevelopment. And, you know, if somebody's tearing down the the building and starting over then that's one thing you know but if they're essentially just making some renovations and some improvements to the site that would facilitate 
uh, traffic flow, uh, maybe improve safety as well, then that could be given consideration. And that whatever, you know, is um, considered would be the minimum adjustment necessary uh, for this particular request. Um, now, one of the things that would be involved in this is the addition of more, um, get this working here, more signage. Uh, currently in the mixed use town center area menu board sign you're allowed one and it can be up to 36 square feet um, so what they're requesting is um, since they would have two essentially ordering points is a menu board pre-menu board and kind of split that up into um, two different locations so and that uh, let me see if I can get this back here try to show that to you on this first drawing the the upper screen shows kind of the existing condition out there and the lower screen shows what it would look like um, if the text amendment um, is uh, passed to allow this so you'd have more freestanding structures but they would be smaller in two different locations um, one thing that could be added to the draft language is that maybe the cumulative total of the menu board signage would not exceed 36 square feet. So, you know, you're, you can have one sign up to 36 square feet, or if you have this kind of split drive through lane situation, then you can, as long as you don't cumulatively, cumulatively exceed 36 square feet, uh, you can have more than the one sign uh, to facilitate that that type of arrangement. So, an applicant is here actually um, to discuss any questions, uh, um, any uh, you know anything that y'all may have on this that, that you're unclear about. They can she can go through what their their request specifically involves and why. Uh, but this is something that before they got started with the renovations, I think some some uh, individuals in, with the McDonald's Corporation wanted to revisit this drive through lane setup in this particular location to see if we could get some more flexibility. And from a staff, staff's perspective, it makes a lot of sense what they're requesting uh, in this context. So I don't know if you all have any questions for me or... Well, you were just suggesting, I assume, that uh, the two signs would be limited to 36 because I can envision that that wouldn't be adequate. To That's kind of what I'm calculating, too. The, the aggregate, I think, is going to be over 36. Over yeah. they've, got a, they've got, if you look at the plans, they've got a what they call a pre-browse board, a digital pre-browse board, and a digital <laughs> menu board on each drive through so a total of four, which I assume are the single 55s? Uh, are they the, double 55s? Right, but the, um, sorry, Kristen Lang, I'm okay. from Britt Peters. Uh, we do the engineering for McDonald's, uh, 101 Falls Park Drive, Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> the last survivor of the planning commission <laughs> meeting. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I am too. I, I like it here. I've been here a lot. I was here for your first meeting last year, uh, and now I'm here for your last. So, um, and I'm impressed that you've been here. Uh, the outdoor digital menu boards are 20 square feet. The pre-browse boards are 10 square feet. Um, we do not have any flexibility. 20 square feet on the outdoor digital menu boards, the main menu boards, and 10 square feet on the pre-browse boards. We do not have any flexibility on square footage. Um, with those old menu boards, the one on the top, um, that one is about 41 to 43 square feet. But your, your aggregate would be 60. If, if I'm, my math is right, you got a 10 and a 20 times two drive-throughs right. for a total of 60 square feet. Right. Okay. 
So on those old ones, we could take a panel off and have flexibility on um, the size of the menu boards. We we don't with these outdoor digital units. They're they're one size and one size only. I take it the double fifty fives are they're somehow measured four by five or something like that. And that's i.e. you're getting the twenty square feet on that. I I, I don't know how they measure. Okay. I I just uh, the and the single that makes sense. The single would be the ten square footer. So that's your right. pre browse right. and that's your menu board. Okay, the pre browse and then the menu board. Okay, the yes. the that's the menu board, right? Okay, right, now, Correct. now yes. we've got it figured out. So, what you're telling us is if we gave you an aggregate of 36, that's not going to cut it. So, that's what we need to work on is, is determine something for, for you guys and going forward. I mean, if we have some other applicants within the MUTC, and we, we are number one, delighted that you're here, and number two, we're delighted to see that McDonald's renovated. And so, what we don't want to do is hold this up. We, uh, we would very much like to see it get brought into the 21st century. So, we are excited that you're here and working with us to, to work through this. The 21st century includes taking down the arches in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> it is not on. The, the, the one site plan that was in there with the red and the black, um, that one, uh, the red is what you approved already, the site plan that was approved for the single drive through lane, and the black was just to show you the impact to the site of adding the side-by-side -side drive through, which is pretty minimal. What are your thoughts on, you've got a fairly impervious site, which we wouldn't allow that today the way that's set up, and and you're entitled to some grandfathering. there. And I see some mitigation going on with removing one of the flower beds and creating a new flower bed in between the two drive throughs One of the questions that I had when I was looking at this the other day is you've got some areas that that are now going to be, some, some areas of your parking lot that's now going to be delineated, no parking with some hash, some hashing. Some striping. Oh, up in the top corner. Well, that was and that was also fine. down kind of at the bottom. If you look at the, the kind of the bottom right hand corner, there's a little triangle down there that's asphalt now. That um, Mark, if you could <coughs> highlight that one as well. What I was going to ask you about is, I mean, we'd love to see you um, actually turn that into flower beds um, and try to get a little bit more pervious surface on your site. Now what we wouldn't want you to do is just put curb and dirt on top of the asphalt. We'd really like for you to go in there and take pull the asphalt up, dispose of it, then put a curb in, backfill it, and actually put some shrubs or some plants in there to try to get you a little bit more. I mean you are right next to a, a major creek. Obviously any any area that we can create on your site that helps kind of clean that water. Um, I, granted the ma vast majority of your water is going to go in the stormwater pond across the, across the street and end up in the creek anyway. But I think it's a good step and a good attempt in the right direction to try to try to be good stewards the best you can and take some of these areas that you are delineating as no parking anyway and maybe turn them into flower beds. So uh, the one at the back, that was just a comment when we had our meeting a couple weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Predating this one. So uh, we just wanted an updated plan for this meeting yeah. and, and, uh, no, yeah, and, and I, did and that. I, and we appreciate And I do. I definitely see the conflicts with somebody trying to back out of that. Um, I've not felt I'm at that McDonald's almost daily grabbing my big unsweet iced tea for a buck oh nine. I'm delighted that you guys are doing this. I don't think you have a parking problem. I think, like you said, I think a lot of your business has transitioned over the years to the drive throughs So I don't think you are short of any parking spots by any means, even when you got all your employees there. At, uh, no, there's still plenty of vacancy parking spots. A lot of times I do go in. And um, so it, I, I don't think that would create a hardship for you guys if some of these spots you've already delineated as no parking if we could see those actually turned into flower beds so i, I just was going to mention that the the other thing is um at the back of the building where you transition from the outside lane of the side-by-side -side drive through that radius all mm -hmm. in there um we we are actually adding pervious in that area too that the back of the building becomes much more pervious than it is right now with um, you know putting the the radius in there for the drive-through yeah. um, and at the front my only uh, concern would be uh, we have to get the truck the delivery truck through the site and um, when we we start um, it blocking uh, with flower beds in the middle of the lane, sometimes that impacts the delivery truck radius. So we would uh, we would have to look at that. We'd have to run the truck on the site and see how it, it goes through there. But um, because the truck runs opposite to the tra traffic flow, 
it doesn't go in with the traffic flow. It, it runs opposite. Okay. So you can get, so you have some sort of loading dock is what you're saying during your off peak hours. You, you're saying you need some of those areas for the, the truck to, the cab of the truck to extend into. Um, it's just it, right there at the, it's a turn and, and sometimes it, it takes more room at the turns to, to make the turn. Um, so I think the way we drove the truck in here, uh, was through that back driveway. Okay. I uh, can think that's a, an admirable goal, Noah, but uh, there's another, I think, even more practical reason why it might not work, and that's because that irrigation would be very difficult to get to those spots, would it not? Well, they're not new isolated spots. They're up against existing flower beds. So, I, I right. mean, they would just tie into existing flower beds. I just, there was a couple of areas in there that have, have been hashed as a as kind of a no parking area. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one flower bed being removed, which to me looks roughly in size to the new flower bed being created in between the two drive lanes. And so I felt like that reasonably mitigates that impervious surface. The um, But I just thought those might be good candidates if you could. Um, obviously the truck, and we want your truck to, to be able to get in and move around. Uh, I'm still kind of struggling exactly how that would inhibit the truck movement, but it very well might. Yeah, I think the areas, and and I know, noticed that when I was looking at particularly the northeast corner, you know, where they're striping that area, that to me was an opportunity to add curbing and put a landscaped area there up here in the corner. And then, like Noah said, perhaps maybe looking at this area here too as, as an opportunity to add more greenery to I said it's tying place. in with the existing uh, flower bed so I think it would address Roseanne's uh, concern about you know landscaping or irrigation so I don't think that that's creating a hardship obviously it's a little bit more work than putting some paint on the asphalt but um, it um, I just it would just get you a little bit closer into, into having a, uh, a site that would be closer to compliance so uh, this site also has a lot of um, perimeter shrubs that are, that are that are very grown so it the you know as far as screening the parking lot um and that back corner has a, has very mature shrubs in it too oh yeah i would definitely wouldn't advocate lot. removing any of those shrubs i was just going to so. supplement those those flower beds so those two areas that market circled so i'm guessing we might have to come back for site plan approval <laughs> no no i don't think so um, i think i think i mean number one number one we've kind of hashed out all this last year um, you know, your change going to a double drive through is kind of a radical change. We understand and empathize the reason why it makes sense. I mean, I mean quite frankly, I'm sure I could get through the drive through getting my iced tea in the morning a little quicker with this setup. I think w we could still approve this uh, subject to these, uh, these items. Uh, if, you know, I, and quite frankly, if you showed that your, your, your truck movements was going to uh, be interfered with these flower beds, I, I would be okay giving the staff the, jur the authority to say, okay, then, then we can go back to this plan. Um, I'd just like to see, I mean, you guys are doing some landscaping here and you're going to be tweaking some things that um, has to do with around the building. It just, this would be a good opportunity to take some of these areas and, and add a little bit more, more greenery, more landscaping. But I, I definitely don't want to hold you guys up. I know you guys have, you know, you got it approved last year, and uh, we're planning on, I think, trying to do it through the winter, and that, for whatever reason, that didn't work out. So I'd very much uh, like to get you guys approved and get you rolling and get your construction finished. Here in the staff developer meeting, we uh, we discussed that north uh, that north corner right there, and one of the concerns, I think, was uh, the cars that uh, are in the drive through are one thing, but the cars that were parked, once they back out and start uh, uh, north, I guess, uh, then they've got to get out. And uh, I think there was a concern that there might be they might be competing uh, in that corner, and that was one of the reasons I think that uh, was pulling the uh, the parking spots out, not not mm -hmm. to curb it and and put a flower bed in, but to give the space to where the people that would be coming out that were parked uh, over on the right side there when you. Uh, would be able to get around the uh, the folks that were in the drive through and, and get on out because sometimes you have people coming in that other way. I'm like you. Yep. I'm a nice tea. Okay. 
Uh, well, and quite that. frankly, when I go, th- when I if I'm going in, I don't park on the east side of the building because of the conflicts with the existing stacking in the drive-through. So I actually go over to the west side up against Firestone and park on that side of the building because I know I can back out and uh, get out of there a little quicker. Otherwise, I'm stuck because somebody is stacked in the drive-through and I can't. I'm stuck in my parking spot. Um, I'm sure you guys deal with this all the time when you're trying, especially on on older sites. You're trying to design the best traffic movements that you can. So I, I, again, I, I would I'd acquiesce to, to whatever the, the commission. I was just making a suggestion. I just thought that might be a good opportunity to to add uh, some some pervious soil conditions that that aren't there today. Yeah, I I agreed with that. I, with the, especially in that northeast corner, that's kind of a new area. If they could if they could uh, take the asphalt out there and make it in more green space, that would be that would be good. Um, something low that's not going to be a visibility obstruction, but you know that. That would be a good suggestion, I think. Um, as far as the ordinance, draft ordinance language, um, other than the menu board signage, um, re- how did y'all feel about that section seven? Does that seem reasonable? We only have, um, let's see, four drive-throughs in the mixed-use town center. Well, five would count Starbucks. Um, so you got the Dairy Queen, Buddies, McDonald's, Taco Bell. Well, and you got a, a bank, a couple of banks in there too. Well, yeah, Mark. Not, uh, yeah. Yes, non-restaurant. Yeah. Okay. I was just talking about restaurants that okay. that we have currently. Menu we have boards. four. We're, we're yeah. private menu boards. Yep. So you know that's not a lot, and uh, but. I mean, I don't know if y'all are okay with with the way this is worded. It's it gives you all a fair amount of flexibility, but it does establish some parameters within which you can make decisions. I think um, as far as how to treat the menu board signage, um, you know, at um, I mean, potentially you could say you can't exceed 30 feet total per. Per ordering point or something, if that's what they're proposing, um, is 30 square feet. And I'm okay with the 60 square feet in aggregate, but I would not want to see a six by ten right. sign, you know, digital menu sign at any one Smaller particular location. Free stand. Maybe but I'm, I'm okay with the 60 square foot aggregate. No, with no single sign being larger than 20 square feet. Yeah, potentially. I think that'd be a good. How do y'all feel about that? If you're going to say 30 square feet per ordering station, do you want to put a limit on the number of ordering stations? How about we just say how about we just say 60 square feet total, no single sign being more than 20, and that way we're not because who knows what the next applicant's going to come before us? It gives us a little bit more flexibility instead of having to do another text amendment. Sounds good to me. That's what I would recommend. Yeah. Just cap a Bottom cap a certain yeah. individual size. That's the, that's the issue. Cap the, yeah, single board at twenty. Aggregate can't be more than sixty. So they can do a twenty, a twenty, a ten, and a ten, but they can't do any one board more than a twenty. Okay. We can add that in there if that sounds good to you. Put that in an ordinance format for next time. Anybody else have any questions? Well, that would. That it would be possible under that scenario mm-hmm. to have three drive-throughs then with uh, 120. Well, that's true. Yeah, you would be. El- I'm, not, I'm not sure I've ever seen three in a fast food, but I'm sure. <laughs> well, neither you know, have I. A, but I'm somebody just thinking out, about out there that's done it. It said, you know, is do we want to limit the number of drive-throughs? You know what? If we go back far enough, there years ago there was a Checkers drive-through where the old. Hollywood video is, which is now a which embryo now a- storage clinic. <laughs> and I'm going back 25 years. I think they might have had three drive throughs Anybody remember that old Checkers? There was a oh, Checkers yeah. burger drive through And there. they were only drive through You couldn't even go in, yeah. um, which I'm sure was probably a challenge in the ordinance, the way we, we've got things written. But um, nevertheless, that was a long time ago. Well, you have to think about the previous conditions in that in that language limit this a lot right you know so your scenario is very unlikely that that would ever 
happen. Yeah. So, yeah, but is, is our goal to get McDonald's, get the text amendment, and get them on the agenda for next month for their site plan at the same time, run run both those concurrent? Is that kind of what you were looking for? We could do that. I mean, if you feel that they need to come come to you with a revised site plan, I mean, I, it's you know that's technically after the deadline because we really weren't considering that. Or if you're comfortable with the staff. Looking I'm, I'm at comfortable their, with this. Do we need to reapprove their site? I mean, is not it a, in my opinion? You're no. saying it's a minor change. To me, it's a it's a change that improves things. Okay. Um, and it's been presented as part of this ordinance amendment, so it's you know it it's not like they're requesting something that is uh, you know more out of line with the ordinance. Uh, they're actually requesting, I think, changes that, you know, improve the site conditions, in my opinion. Well, especially if we could get, you know, a few more square feet of pervious yeah, conditions. Absolutely. Yeah, if they could work on that and try to take make an opportunity out of that, I think that would that would be great. Okay. Do you want to make a motion? Well, I don't think it's a, it's not an action item, is it? No, it's just a okay. workshop. Okay, we're just kind of workshopping yeah, we'll, it. But okay, we'll, we'll put it together as an ordinance. But for next the ordinance, time. we'll be ready next month for an action. Is that correct? Okay. With the sixty square feet. Yes, okay. we'll add aggregate. that in there. Aggregate, right? Yes. Does that? Do you think we've addressed? You think we're going to be able to address your needs with with that text amendment? Okay. I think so. Great. All right. Because it, it specifically the addresses. Thing. Sorry. Just asking them, just going to ask them to give that consideration? Um, that's what I would do. Yeah, I would ask them to evaluate that and see if they can work that in to make it a, a landscape area. One of the I mean, it's twos? parking spaces now, so it's right. not like they're taking a existing landscaped area and making it just hardscape, you know. Well, they are doing a little bit of that, but it appears to me, just by eyeballing it, it's, that the new bed that they're going to create roughly mitigates yeah, the old bed they're taking out. It, yeah, it does. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Well, if you all are comfortable with, with us working with them on that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I, don't, yes. I don't see that that needs a separate site plan review. If, it, if you all are comfortable with that. I agree. Okay. I am. All righty. Sounds good. We'll have it on for July 17th, I think it is. Come back over the mountain one more time. <laughs> well, isn't there? And I hope you don't have to go I'm back sure tonight. To be, unless you're just dying to come back over from Greenville. I, I don't necessarily um, <laughs> think that under that scenario, unless we feel like there's something else that we're missing or, uh, you know, something contentious, that she needs to come back over for the, for the. It'll actually have to also go to the board of mayor and alderman for yeah. for the first and second reading as well, and that, which will be probably in August. But uh, but now, long story short, I I really don't see the need for her to have to make a trip over again. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's fine. Yeah. As someone that, like coming over here. Yeah. <laughs> As some, with what I drove through Knoxville tonight, no. um, <laughs> I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> yeah, somebody it drives was, over that mountain a lot. I. Yeah, yeah. You're lucky. At least, hopefully, the rock slide has been all cleared out. Yes, now. yes. So. Yes. The thunderstorms and the tornado but warning. The tornado <laughs> warning on the sign tonight, driving through, was interesting. Yeah, I'm glad we don't have. Well, we appreciate guys. you coming, and be yeah. careful going back. Thank you very yeah. much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. Okay, we have. Um, <clears throat> yes, we have uh, item number ten. Appointment to Stormwater Advisory Committee representative. Uh, this has to be somebody from currently on the planning yes, commission. Yes, it does. And, um, I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Louise Pavel. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, we just hope without her being here tonight, she accepts. Yeah, was that because she's not here today? That's, what ha that's, that's your punishment <laughs> for not being here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think she. Knew, I don't know think it. she yes. knew about that. <laughs> Gray Ron. Uh, she did. Send her a congratulatory email. Yeah, she she has already been involved with uh, 
interest in the storm water. Yeah, so. she has an interest in storm water uh, matters. Yeah. Uh, item number 11, discussion on the Planning Commission procedures is applied to the number of significant comments that remain on plans intended to come before the Commission and how to address the approval of subject twos that are not taken care of in a timely manner. Uh, this is a workshop discussion item, um, and really we're just asking for your feedback on a couple of issues that really have been issues for a while, and, and the staff you know, feels like you may want to consider formalizing uh, some procedures on subject twos and yep. um, projects that receive subject two approvals, but the subject twos kind of linger on and they aren't taken care of in a timely manner. Uh, those are things that, um, let me just put up a couple of, I just called out a few um, subject two categories. So, you know, um, certainly there's some plans that come before us where the subject twos are items that um, are not a problem. There are a lot of times they they wouldn't be able to have that item at the time it is presented to the Planning Commission. For example, a notice of coverage is oftentimes that takes a little bit longer to run that through TDEC. <clears throat> and uh, so, um, you know, that would typically not be something they would even have the ability to have in place before they come before you all. And then letters of credit, drainage permit fees, you know, typos, clerical errors, as long as they're not widespread, um, would be considered acceptable subject twos. But then we get uh, some things that um, are subject twos or have been that are pretty significant, you know, major missing information. Um, information that um, is really design related and could affect um, the design significantly uh, when that comment is addressed. Um, we feel that sometimes um, an applicant may come before you all and, and you all are put, and the staff frankly, are put in an awkward position of approving something with you know, when something really wasn't ready for you all to take action on. And uh, we've had a number of projects over the years where there's been, you know, numerous subject twos, uh, some of which would require pretty substantial resubmittals <clears throat> that then the staff is kind of responsible for trying to clean up and make sure that those get addressed, that we interpreted your action properly, and it just puts everyone in a in a little bit of an awkward situation. And it really, frankly, is is unfair to the different designers that we have. You know, if if a designer takes the time to uh, go through our requirements and make sure that when they submit their package, that it's very complete. Um, you know that person should be rewarded with a timely review and approval process, whereas somebody that just throws something together to get it within a deadline, uh, but it's really very incomplete and requires the staff to review this two or three, four times, uh, then, you know, from the staff's perspective, that should be something that uh, would not be considered for action. Uh, so they would hopefully get the message that um, they need to spend a little bit more time on their plans before they submit them and don't and don't make the staff essentially the, the quality control <laughs> for some of these projects um, which unfortunately uh, happens more more often than it should uh, so what we drafted was just maybe some language that uh, as you know next month is the annual meeting where we uh, appoint officers and review any changes to bylaws and things like that. So this may be an opportunity to consider uh, something in writing that could formalize how subject twos are addressed uh, to give both staff and the planning commission some cover 
when you have, um, you know, something that is still on the agenda because we do have to get agendas advertised uh, within a certain time frame. So sometimes we don't have plans resubmitted until the agenda's already been advertised for notification purposes. Um, and, you know, when that item is has been resubmitted, if it's still, in the staff's opinion, um, incomplete, then, um, you know, it would be helpful to have some, you know, policies uh, in a resolution format, preferably, that we could refer back to in recommending at the meeting that that application be postponed. And in the case of a subdivision plat, if the applicant hasn't signed the waiver for um, the Planning Commission acting on, on their request, then if the application is incomplete, the staff would have to recommend denial of that plat. Uh, and that's consistent with the state law. So you, you don't have as much flexibility with acting on those as you would with the site plan, for example. So similar to that small cell structure, there are certain shot clocks that um, apply to different types of items that might come before you and you have to take action on them one way or the other. So, um, so I don't know if you all have looked, had a chance to look through this, this language. Uh, if you think it sounds reasonable, um, or if you have any, um, comments or questions about that, or if you think it's something that's even needed in the first place. Okay. Um, Mark, I have a few comments. Okay. One, uh, let me get a little historical perspective. And I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need to do something to codify the situ and okay. help the situation. Yeah. Uh, from a perspective standpoint, once upon a time, we felt <laughs> that, and particularly the chairman at that time and myself being engineers, felt we were literally being used and the staff was being used at these meetings to be a, a design review meeting. I, I mean, it was pages of comments. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, pages. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we, we, we dealt with that issue, but we, of course, shifted that more back to you all being, you know, running interference and filtering for it, but it's yeah. obviously it seems to have gotten you know, worse again at that level anyway. So codifying something to, to deal with that, it, I would wholeheartedly recommend that uh, in, in, in favor of doing something. You know, the way it's something that's been adopted, it's been presented at a public uh, meeting uh, as a resolution. And, you know, it's not just, well, we just don't feel like that this is complete or. Well, we know. established the expectations. Absolutely. Formally. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And that's what we haven't done historically. Right. We have not codified it. No, we um, put you in the position to, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. verbally with or written was however you had yeah. to deal with the situation applicant yeah. by applicant <laughs> yeah that's right you and I have discussed the fact that some of we get some um, project in and you all spend hours on it we spend a couple of months at the meetings or something and then you don't hear back from them anymore yeah period well that's um, another that's another element in this it's the last basically the last paragraph of this draft is talking about, um, you know, if you, you get a approval that has some subject twos, if they don't address those subject twos within some time frame, the mm -hmm. language here is just 180 days, that that's, you know, up for discussion certainly, um, that that application would actually then be considered void and they'd have to come back through the whole process again. Um, and Which this this happens actually very very frequently. Yes, uh, you'd be we surprised. We have to reapply and pay the yes. application that's, fee again. That's exactly right. Get more skin in the game. I think it. 180 is is too lenient. Well, that's uh, like I, really I said. Do. That's I, for discussion. I mean, I, I, I think uh, <laughs> I'm looking threw it out as a timeline for. Yeah. for well, I'm looking input. at the first two sentences here. Uh, the first one uh, is. Uh, subject to interpretation it's subjective large what is large you know uh, what is significant uh, so forth but I do like 
the next sentence that does seem to qualify it somewhat by saying should be as complete as professionally practical. I think, as Ed has pointed out, <laughs> their engineering standards, certainly, uh, design standards, architectural standards, yeah. and whatnot that yeah, there are, there are yeah, that should be followed, be, and I think and this kind of captures that CFC type right. pr process. Professionally practical, I think, does narrow it down considerably. But I, I would propose that that 180 days uh, be more like uh, uh, 90 myself. Mark and I have been talking about the fact that um, sometimes it's putting together the financials that um, seem to be a holdup. How, how long does that take, Noah? I, mean, I realize it varies project to project, yeah, but... I get concerned about the 90 days. I mean, there are some times when you're dealing with TDOT, it just takes a lot longer than you think it's going to take. I, I think 180 days probably is the right number. Right. I, I think that... There are um, there are a lot of other details that do get worked out, and sometimes we do approve plans that are never built, um, and because the after they've got a plan that's been approved, then they take it and try to go get their financing. What um, what Rita was saying, and that can take time. So I, I mean, I think that my instinct is ninety days feels too short. Um, that one hundred eight days probably is the right right amount of time to be able to give somebody to work through those deals. And before, we really haven't. We've just kind of left it open-ended. I mean, think if you think about the McDonald's site plan, we approved that in October of 2018. So if their 90, their 90 days have already come and gone. And um, so they'd have to start back over again. And I, I don't necessarily think that's the fair thing to do. Of course, you know what? Quite frankly, their 180 days has probably come and gone as yeah, well. Yeah, but the two, there's but, two kinds of situations, though. I don't well, want to interrupt. I mean, they you address. Got, you've got some that they control, and you've got and they get some, some out of there. Some that, that may be 90, and there's something that's up to 180 if you're dealing yeah. with the Well, government McDonald's or addressed or the subject, too, so their site plan situation. approval. They did address well, those. Well, even all their letters, and I mean, so they're eligible for a, for a permit? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they just the decided, I guess, at a corporate level that they wanted to revisit that drive-through setup. The, um, mm -hmm. the, uh, I, I do think it's important in interest of transparency to try to set these expectations out there in a, um, in a way, i.e. a policy or codify it. I think it's important. I, I do see the staff um, I, uh, being abused is not the right term. But it's it they probably feel up. like they're being abused, used, uh, used, <laughs> where especially when we see some of the same comments over and over again. Um, I'm not going to try to pick on any particular projects, but there's there was a project that this board saw that we probably had be before us. I don't know. It felt like <laughs> 10 times. Maybe it was six or eight times. That was a struggle. And there's a lot of the same comments over and over again that the staff's like, well, they, you know, they still have it. They're expecting us to find it again. And I think that's unfair to the staff. I think in interest of efficiency upstairs, I think this would help. It's it's going to take a while to feel those effects. But I think um, this is a really good step and a fair step in the right direction about letting the consultant community, i.e. the civil engineers, are predominantly the ones that are going to be dealing with this. Surveyors would deal with it as well on, on a plat level. But I think it's it, it, being transparent with them and letting them know, hey, these are our expectations. And um, if you get kicked to next month's meeting, this is the reason why you got kicked next month's meeting. It's just because it's not because we don't like you. Um, it's because that uh, your plans quite aren't ready for the planning commission and they're still an incomplete set. So I, I like where we're going with this. I do, I would, um, I'd be really concerned about tightening it to 90 days. I think 180 days is, is appropriate. Well, I certainly can def defer and understand what you're saying that, but I, I like Ed's comment uh, about if it's outside their control, then that's understandable. That's a reason for it taking longer than the 90 days, but I'm a new member on the planning, relatively new now, on the planning commission. Uh, but I've just been amazed at the number of approvals we've given with so many subject twos. 
that appeared to me that could have been resolved by the architecture or uh, design team or the engineering, whatever, might have been appropriate. Oh, you, uh, you would be agree. surprised at the number we used to see. The, we used, I remember seeing the days we'd see 70 or 80. Yes, yeah, a step. Oh, over 100 yeah. on one yeah. project. Right back so, up you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe 180 days might be appropriate if we get some of these other menial yeah. well, subject the, twos out of the way. One you know. of the things that always makes me really mad when I see them are the like they numbered the pages wrong or they've um, got the wrong date in there or little things like that that no business ought to put something like that out. But but Mark gets those and he's sitting there going, you need to number the pages consecutively or you need to put the name of so-and-so in here. And those are... are very yeah. that just makes me mad to see that and it's an editing job that should have been done in the right in it's the very office yeah. Yeah. So that's back to quality control i okay. think uh, you you have to look at it that way I, uh, what uh is puzzling to me is uh, you know i come to the, to the uh staff developer meetings and i see uh 10 subject twos and then, and then it comes to the planning commission and i see the, the same still 10 subject twos they've not addressed them i mean it's like it happens sometimes, did, yeah. You know, did you not get it? Why, why <laughs> didn't you? Why didn't you look at that? Yeah, yeah I can understand if you have uh, where you have a lot of uh, public input, like what we have on some projects. I mean, it could uh, could delay things, but uh, you know, it's so the 180, I guess, is a good number. Because I, I think the 180 is a good number. I mean, there's going to be some things where the developer is is going to need some guidance if 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 the developers trying to it's having a tough time is trying to stay exactly in between the lines that the staff would like the developer to be in then the developer needs some guidance from for, from the planning commission and that's going to be where the staff's going to make a recommendation just like what you know we did with the with the cell tower that you know i the, the developer with the cell tower the cell pole knew that we really didn't like that cell pole on heron road and the reality is, is they didn't make any revisions to their plans. They were, they were looking for this body to give them some relief, which we were uh, reluctant to do. And so I think there's, I, I, kinda, I agree with the philosophy the staff is going with here, you, because you just can't say it's a hard and fast number. You can't say, well, any more than 10 subject twos, right. you're worth throwing you out. Oh, that would be the easy thing to do. And I thought about that. I said, but you know, every, every project's a little bit different. Especially when when we were in, in we, not not all subject twos are created equally, and that's exactly right. Not all subject twos, and now some of them are, are are frustrating for the staff, and some of them should be just downright embarrassing on the consultant that prepared it. I mean, there are some yeah. dumb things in there that we all kind of scratch our heads, going, I, you know, that that sh that shouldn't have made it to this body. I mean, you should have a little better quality control in your office to uh, to do that. And you know, these in this environment, in this economy, they're busy and. And and things slip through. I, I don't necessarily think they should be punished for it, but I do think that this gives some meat on the bone for the staff to say, "Hey, th you've got some things that are extraordinary here um, that are not boilerplate subject twos, and i.e., you're not going to be heard this month." And I can assure you, a consultant is going to learn really fast when they have a real mad applicant a frustrated developer who says now you're you're costing my project 30 days because of all your you know your silly typos or you know some information that they that you didn't provide that you should have provided so i think it'll i think it, the 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 guilty parties and there's probably some civil engineers that are worse than others i think they will correct their behavior pretty fast when they start getting bumped and and i think this is a fair way of saying that hey here it is in our policy uh in full disclosure, you know, why don't you read this before you apply, and and that way the staff doesn't have to be the bad guy. Say, so, hey, you know, the, these are things that you should have taken care of that aren't haven't been taken care of, or these are things that we asked you to take care of months ago, and there were two weeks ago, and a staff developer that would have been fairly easy to address. So I I, I think this is a, a real good direction. I think all of your language in here makes a lot of sense, um, and I think the. I think the 180 days, and you know, at some point in the future, if the 180 days we feel like it's still too long, we could address it. If it's too short, we could address it again at some point in the future. But I think this is a, a real good draft that the staff's put together here. Well, we could always make it no more than 180 days, and the planning commission, if they're so minded, can 
uh, on a case-by-case basis, uh, depending on the length of time that it might take or what was involved, like you say, if you're dealing with TDOT or some such, that it might take the 180, then okay. Uh, make it part of our motion. Yeah. We, part yeah, of our motion, that's what I'm saying. We see no reason why you can't do this within uh, 90 right. days. Therefore, yeah. our part of the motion, well, these should be set aside within 90 days. I think it would help. The the, the quicker that the the items can get addressed, the, the simpler it is. I mean, it's kind of like... I don't know. Have you ever have you ever been reading a novel and then all, you put down you put down the novel and you pick up another novel? To start back up. You got to start back over on it. And so I can understand when the staff is looking at these things, you're kind of starting over from scratch. Going, okay, now what? Why did we do that? Why did we ask? You know, have that comment on there? And so I think the longer that that uh, that gets drug out, the more unfair it is to staff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll get a lot more work out of the staff if they don't have to do that. You know. Well, so if, if we can make the staff more efficient, <laughs> um, you know that that would that would you know it's improve their quality true, of lives yeah. and you yeah. know hopefully maybe yeah. save the taxpayers a, a few bucks from having to hire another staff member to be able to do these things yeah. if we can make your office more efficient. I think it's great that we have the staff. You know, you're talking about some of those those work agenda items that keep getting pushed forward that you that you were that you wanted to complete exactly. right. <laughs> that you can't complete. Yeah. yeah, I can understand. I think it's great that we have a solution that the staff has presented that our resident developer thinks is a good idea. So I, <laughs> I think it's a fair idea. I think it's it's fair, and that's what it's about. I, I think it's it's fair and appropriate. So the. Uh, people doing the design, I would say the developers are also pushing them to get it through. Get yeah, it sure through, they get are. It through. Sure they are. You know, you don't have a large staff of people checking. Yeah. And like you do in a lot of, you know, I'll say nuclear yeah. type design or something that's yeah. more safety based criteria where you have to have something like that. So there's a there's a whole equation there of who's pushing who and how much it's costing and whatever that drives mm -hmm. a lot of what we mm -hmm. see. And that's not, that's not universal across everybody. This is not isolated to the town of Farragut. I can assure you all the other planning staffs around the country all deal with And the town's still going to deal with this. Even after we mm -hmm. adopt this policy, the town, there's still going to be projects. some situations where uh, the town's, you know, it's it's still not the most efficient use of the, of the staff's time to have to keep re-reviewing the, the same mistakes or the same uh, omissions over and over again. Yeah. Well, we can put it in a resolution format if that's all right yes it's all right yes yeah. definitely all right um and believe it or not it is a lot better than it used to be before this we had the staff development yeah, i remember one that had over 120. Oh, yeah. <laughs> i'm not going to say what it was I can, I, I can remember making a speech i think it turned into a lecture of a <laughs> we didn't want to see it again <laughs> So we'll see this next month. Is that your plan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In a in a timely manner. <laughs> um, so well, approval of utilities. Minutes. We uh, have, have no any. utilities. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. The June twentieth meeting of the Fairview Municipal Planning Commission is adjourned. <laughs>